Coming up, the tragedy of the Great War. While the First World War was an unspeakable catastrophe for Europe and those who had to fight it, it's mistaken also to consider it from an Allied perspective to have been futile. Historian Sir Max Hastings argues for the necessity of World War I and details the brutality of 1914 and the German regime. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Our speaker is Sir Max Hastings. Today he will be discussing one of the most compelling dramas of modern times, one which he has majestically captured in his latest work entitled Catastrophe 1914, Europe Goes to War. This work tells us about the diplomatic events leading up to the outbreak of the Great War, along with an account of the first five months of the conflict. There's a widely held view, a delusion, as I shall argue, that the two world wars belong to different moral orders. That where 1939-45 was a good war, 1914-18 was a bad one. That the first conflict was so horrendous that the merits of the two sides' causes scarcely matters. The British and American peoples have always had a vivid idea of um, what they think happened in World War II. But our ideas about the First World War are much cloudier um, and indeed thoroughly confused, even among educated people. Few have much idea why Europe exploded, though they may know that a Ruritanian bigwig with an extravagant mustache got shot in Sarajevo. The most widely held view is that the conflict was simply a ghastly mistake in which for which all the European powers shared blame, its folly compounded by the brutish incompetence of military commanders. This is what I would characterize as the poet's view, first articulated by the likes of Siegfried Sassoon, Robert Graves, Wilfred Owen. Amid the mud and blood, they felt that no cause could be worth the slaughter. Today, some British people, and perhaps also some Americans, feel almost embarrassed that we finished up on the winning side. Yet my own opinion is somewhat different, that while the war was assuredly a colossal tragedy, there was a cause at stake. Certainly Britain couldn't plausibly have remained neutral, while Germany secured hegemony over the continent. I suggest that Western civilization has almost as much reason to be grateful that German ambitions were frustrated in 1918 as in 1945, despite the appalling cost and even if the outcome of the first clash proved to have a tragic impermanence because Germany, this time under Hitler, had to be fought all over again a generation later. I won't today detail events in the summer of 1914, but I'll offer a quick pricey. On the 28th of June, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was shot dead by a young Bosnian Serb terrorist. The men in charge of Austria felt no special sorrow for Franz Ferdinand, whom they disliked but they saw in the outrage an ideal pretext for settling accounts with Serbia, a chronically troublesome little neighbor whose leaders incited their own minorities to revolt. One aspect of 1914, which is very important and seems to our generation incomprehensible, most European nations regarded war not as the supreme horror, but as a usable instrument of policy. Many interpretations of how the conflict came about are possible and deserve respect. But the only one that seems to me untenable is that it was accidental. Every government believed that it acted rationally in pursuit of its national interests. Austria decided in the first days of July to invade and then break up Serbia because everybody knew that Russia regarded this Slavic nation as under the Tsar's protection Vienna dispatched an envoy to Berlin to ensure German backing if the Russians interfered. On the 6th of July, Kaiser Wilhelm and his chancellor gave the Austrians what historians call the blank check, an unqualified promise of German diplomatic and, if necessary, military support for crushing Serbia. This was incredibly reckless. Some modern historians have produced elaborate arguments to deflect blame from Germany for what followed. But it seems to me impossible to escape this undisputed fact. The Kaiser's government endorsed Austria's decision to unleash a Balkan war, and this predated everything the Entente Allies did. The Austrians duly declared war on Serbia on the 28th of July and started bombarding Belgrade. The Russians mobilized three days later. Uh, apologists for Germany point out that the Tsar's armies thus moved before the Kaiser's did. 
But the Russian government saw no choice. The vast distances of their country meant that it must take longer for their forces to concentrate. They were terrified the Germans would literally steal a march on them. A bizarre triumphalism overtook Berlin's corridors of power on the 31st of July. After the Kaiser signed Germany's mobilization order at his Berlin palace, with his unfailing instinct for the wrong gesture, he ordered champagne to be served to his suite. A Bavarian general who visited the war ministry soon after news came of Russian mobilization noted, everywhere beaming faces, people shaking hands in the corridors, congratulating one another. Russia had acted in accordance with the avowed hopes of Germany's military leadership. The Kaiser's generals now merely expressed fears that France might decline to follow suit. Wilhelm despised the French as a feminine race, not manly like the Anglo-Saxons or Teutons, and this influenced his lack of apprehension about fighting them. The French knew that the German war plan required a swift, smashing defeat of their own army before turning on Russia. Sure enough, Berlin sent a message to Paris saying that unless France surrendered, its frontier fortresses to Germany as a guarantee, its neutrality would not be accepted. Instead, and inevitably, the French mobilized. As for Britain, even at this very late hour, most of its government and people opposed involvement in Europe's war. They had no sympathy for either Serbia or Russia. Some instead had a real fellow feeling towards Germany and its culture. But then, suddenly, everything changed. Germany blundered. Its war plan demanded an assault on France through Belgium, of whose neutrality Britain was a guarantor. Berlin formally notified London of its intention to invade. Moltke was so sure Britain would come into the war anyway that he decided that marching through Belgium would change nothing. He could not have been more wrong. That decision caused the British government to send an ultimatum to Germany, committing the country to fight unless the invaders drew back, as of course they didn't. On the 4th of August, Britain became the last major European power to enter the struggle. What followed in the ensuing four years was so appalling for mankind that some people suggest that Germany's triumph would have been a lesser evil. But the Kaiserreich's record abroad was barbarous even by contemporary standards. Berlin mandated in advance and applauded after the event the 1904-7 genocide of the Herero and Namaqua peoples of German Southwest Africa, an enormity far beyond the scope of any British colonial misdeed and responsible for 100,000 deaths. Though some German socialists denounced the slaughter, the Kaiser decorated the senior officers who carried it out. A few historians argue that Britain could have remained neutral in 1914 and prospered mightily by doing so. But the dominating instincts of Germans' leadership would hardly have been moderated by the victory on the continent that would almost certainly have been the consequence of British neutrality. The Kaiser's regime didn't go to war with a grand plan for world domination, but its leaders quickly identified massive rewards as their price for granting an armistice to the Allies. On the 9th of September 1914, when Berlin saw victory looming, Germany's chancellor drafted a shopping list. France was to surrender to Germany its entire iron ore deposits, the frontier region of Belfort, a coastal strip from Dunkirk to Boulogne, which was to be resettled by German veterans, the western slopes of the Vosges Mountains. Her strategic fortresses would be demolished and huge cash reparations paid. Luxembourg would be annexed outright, Belgium and Holland transformed into vassal states, Russia's borders drastically shrunken. A vast colonial empire created in Central Africa, together with a German economic union extending from Scandinavia to Turkey. Machiavelli observed that wars begin when you will, but do not end when you please. Could any responsible ally government between 1914 and 18 have granted such a peace as Germany sought and such as it imposed on the Russians after its 1917 victory over them? It remains hard to see how Allied statesmen could have extracted themselves once the struggle began until there was a decision on the battlefield. Almost every sane combatant recoiled from the miseries of the battlefield, but this didn't mean they thought their country should acquiesce in the triumph of their enemies. George Orwell wrote with his accustomed insight 30 years later, 
that the only way to end a war quickly is to lose it. It's a myth that Europeans welcomed the outbreak in 1914. Most were appalled. But some romantics and nationalists did enthuse, among them an Austrian housewife who wrote lyrically in her diary about the grandeur of the times, the superb spectacle of the world bursting into flames. Elsewhere, however, there was a terrible dismay. And not only on the eastern side of the Atlantic, an Indiana newspaper editor wrote with a disdain widely shared across the American continent, we never appreciate so keenly as now the foresight exercised by our forefathers in emigrating from Europe. Winston Churchill wrote after it was all over, no part of the Great War compares in interest with its opening. The measured, silent drawing together of gigantic forces, the uncertainty of their movements and positions, the number of unknown and unknowable facts made the first collision a drama never surpassed. Nor was there any other period in the war when the general battle was waged on so great a scale, when the slaughter was so swift or the stakes so high. Moreover, in the beginning, our faculties of wonder, horror, and excitement had not been cauterized and deadened by the furnished fires of years. All this was so, though few of Churchill's fellow participants regarded those vast events with such eager appetite. Many British people were at first uncertain whether they'd entered the war on the right side. But opinions hardened fast when reports emerged about the conduct of the German invaders of Belgium. Yes, some of the stories of main babies were fictions, mere crude propaganda. But the most modern scholarly research shows that beyond burning Louvain, several other towns and many villages, the Germans shot in cold blood as hostages or in alleged reprisals some 6,400 perfectly innocent Belgian and French civilians of all ages and both sexes. While it's mistaken to compare the Kaiser's regime to that of the Nazis a generation later, its conduct in 1914 scarcely suggests that its victory would have been a triumph for European civilization. As for the way the war was fought, Almost every modern scholar agrees that it's an illusion to imagine there was ever an easy path towards winning it, even had commanders of Napoleonic gifts led the armies. In any struggle between great 20th century industrial nations, an enormous amount of killing and dying had to happen before one side or the other prevailed. What distinguished the Second World War from the First wasn't that Britain and its allies had better or more humane commanders in the later conflict, but that between 1941 and 45, the Russians accepted almost all the sacrifice necessary to beat the Nazis, 27 million dead, and were responsible for 92% of the German army's total war loss. Although heaven knows it didn't seem so to those who were around at the time, the Western Allies paid only a small fraction of the blood price of winning World War II. By contrast, 1914-18, the British and French people paid a much heavier forfeit, double that of 39.45 for us, more than treble for France. In the early weeks of the 1914 war, battles were fought utterly unlike those that came later, and indeed more like the clashes of Napoleon's era than those of the 20th century. Every nation launched almost immediate offensives, save the British, whose little expeditionary force was still in transit when the armies of France first clashed with those of Germany. The most costly single day of the entire 1418 conflict was the 22nd of August, when the French lost 27,000 dead. Many people associate 1914-18 with wire, trenches, mud, and tin hats. Yet those early battles weren't remotely like that. In the late summer of 1914, France's army advanced to the attack across virgin countryside wearing red trousers and blue overcoats, led by bands playing, yes, bands, flags flying, and officers mounted on chargers, wearing white gloves and waving swords. In one clash on the morning of the 22nd of August, in thick fog, French columns marched north through the village of Vierton, just inside Belgium. Cavalry, trotting ahead, approached a farm at the top of a steep hill and met enemy, enemy fire. A day of chaos and blood ensued. 
The Germans started to advance, ordered by their officers to identify themselves in the murk by singing national songs. Their opponents likewise struck up the Marseillaise, which proved the last tune that many of the choristers ever sung. Suddenly, dramatically, the mist lifted. The French infantry, cavalry and artillery batteries found themselves exposed in full view of the German gunners on the hilltop. A slaughter followed. The infantry tried to renew their advance uphill in short rushes. French field service regulations assumed that uh, in 20 seconds, attackers could run 50 yards before an enemy could reload their rifles. They were wrong. A survivor of Vieton observed bitterly, the people who wrote those regulations have simply forgotten the existence of such things as machine guns. We could distinctly hear two of those coffee grinders at work. Every time our men got up to advance, the line got thinner. Finally, our captain gave the order, fix bayonets and charge. It was midday by now and devilish hot. Our men in full kit started running heavily up that grassy slope, drums beating, bugles sounding the charge. We were all shot down. I was hit and lay there until I was picked up later. Further north, on that same dreadful 22nd of August, another force advanced up a forest road in the Ardennes. France had always planned to exploit its colonial mercenaries in a war to make good its shortage of white manpower against Germany. In 1910, a general named Charles Mulgar had written a deplorable book entitled La Force Noire, in which he said about France's black soldiers, in future battles, these primitives, for whom life counts so little and whose young blood flows so ardently as if eager to be shed, will attain the old French fury. Now war had come, and Moroccans, Senegalese, Algerians, and such like were indeed hurled foremost into the flames. By 1918, France's African troops had suffered a death rate shockingly higher than that of their white comrades because they were so often selected for suicidal tasks. One of the first felt the 3rd Colonial Infantry Division on the 22nd of August. Its units advanced in column through the village of Rossignol and then up a narrow road into a forest named Onlier. The French had not reconnoitred. Horse, foot and guns simply marched into the midst of the woodland led by the Chasseur d'Afrique. German troops among the trees waited patiently until the whole division was committed and then unleashed a torment of fire which within minutes shattered the formation. Trapped on the narrow track, horses, men, carts, guns, milled in chaos until the lucky men contrived to surrender. The division lost 228 officers and 10,272 other ranks, including 3,800 made prisoner. In a dozen battles along the frontiers of France, did 27,000 young Frenchmen perish on the 27th of August without gaining a yard of ground. One general wrote laconically to Joffre, the commander-in-chief, on the whole, results hardly satisfactory. Next day, the British endured their own first little action on the canal at Mons, just inside Belgium. They fought gallantly enough, but heavily outnumbered, they had no choice but to retreat that night. Three days later, at Le Cato, they staged another rearguard action which resembled a battle out of the Napoleonic Wars. Nobody had trenches. The Germans advanced across stooped cornfields, against British infantry and artillery deployed in full view to meet them. The slaughter was nothing like as severe as the French had faced, but British losses at Le Cato were as heavy as they suffered a war later on the 6th of June 1944 on D-Day in Normandy. Then the British and French alike found themselves retreating, retreating southwards across France towards Paris under a blazing sun and occasional thunderstorms in the face of apparently invincible German masses. In the last days of August, it seemed overwhelmingly likely, not least to the Kaiser and his generals, that Germany was on the brink of absolute triumph. I've ended my narrative of 1914 with the story of the first Battle of Ypres in October and November. In a western corner of Belgium, the French and British held the line against huge and apparently endless German attacks at the cost of leaving most of their men, the old sweats of Britain's professional army, to repose forever in local cemeteries. The Allied victory at Ypres, for victory it was, frustrated the Germans' last attempt to achieve a war-winning breakthrough in the West in 1914. But it was purchased at such cost in suffering and sacrifice that nobody felt like celebrating. 
Ypres was the first true trench battle of the war, fought amid mud and blood and sometimes waist-high water. Those who take, took part, who have been accustomed to the idea that a battle was something that lasted one day or two or three, are now discovered very, very differently. Found it impossible to imagine that such a struggle could continue for many more weeks, far less for four years. Let me finish where I started by emphasizing my own belief that while the First World War was an unspeakable catastrophe for Europe and those who had to fight it, it's mistaken also to consider it from an Allied perspective to have been futile. In the summer of 1918, the Allies, now including the United States, belatedly achieved a great victory on the Western Front, which led to the armistice Germany was obliged to accept in November. All deaths in all wars are cause for lamentation. But the only credible alternative to the huge sacrifice made by the Allies was that a German military dictatorship prevailed, whose arbitration would have been vastly more draconian for Europe than the flawed treaty signed at Versailles in June 1919. Thank you all very much indeed. Another um, phase of the F First World War that has its echoes in the in the uh, future and even today is um, the events in Ireland. Um, Ireland. Uh, just wondering um, to what extent was the First World War the spark that set that Republican revolution? A significant number of leading British players said um, as war in the last days of July and the first days of August that the one good thing about all this, Gray, even Sir Edward Gray, the British Foreign Secretary, even said in the House of Commons, that one good thing about the European crisis was it was deflecting attention from Ireland, um, which with hindsight is a fantastic thing to say, but that's how. Um, one thing about politicians generally is that they find it very difficult to address more than one crisis at a time. And um, my hero among historians, a British, British historians, is Michael Howard, um, now 90, but still razor sharp and the repository of enormous wisdom. He said, one must never forget that because the European war happened, we didn't have a civil war in Ireland. But we must remember that in 1914, people really did think that a civil war was going to happen in Ireland, and it really could have happened. When the war broke out on August the 4th, a lot of British aristocrats offered um, facilities to the government, including their houses as hospitals, most of which had to be turned down because the drains were so inadequate. Um, but the Duke of Sutherland said that he could provide a fully equipped medical facilities staffed by 40 doctors and nurses in Victoria Street in the middle of London. And they were all baffled at the idea that on August the 9th this facility was available at the Ducal hand. An Admiralty official was sent round to look at it. He absolutely stunned. He found it was all there all right. The Duke of Sutherland had established this medical facility to support the Ulster volunteer force in the looming Ulster Civil War. Yes, its impact was, uh, was enormous. And, uh, Again, to quote Michael Hard again, which I never apologize for doing, he hates counterfactuals and he refuses to take seriously any historian who engages in them. He says the duty of historians is to tell people what did happen, not what might. And the moment you move one variable, so many alternatives become possible that the whole thing becomes meaningless. Um, and therefore, I rather share that view that the, the Irish situation was so complex that um, it's fantastically hard to say what might have happened in Ireland, maybe home rule for the whole island would have come about and peacefully, and maybe the rest of Irish history and the British would have been happier. But I'm rather in Michael's persuasion. It, it, there, there's so many possible variables, but, um, but certainly what is important is that the British government only started paying serious attention to the um, European crisis. Not that they could have done much about it anyway. On about the 25th, 26th of July, because they were completely fixed on the Irish crisis. And, you know, you've got a conference of Buckingham Palace, which had broken down. You've got the prospect of civil war. Just because it didn't happen, one should never forget, they thought it was going to happen. Maybe you could speak to the U.S. involvement and from the perspective of a U.S. policymaker, did our involvement make sense given the flaws in Versailles, the loss of life, etc.? I think it probably did make sense in terms of the good of the world because... Um, um, it brought the whole thing to a conclusion, which might otherwise, it might otherwise have gone on much longer. The American military contribution was actually not significant, but the American economic and naval blockade contribution was enormous. The blockade only really, really started to work, importantly, in, uh, towards Germany when America came in. Um, 
very interesting stuff. There's a book, Planning for Armageddon, that came out uh, about a year ago. Excellent book about British blockade policy. And until I read it, I hadn't realized um, that's based on a lot of original research in the British archives, how far the British didn't dare introduce a really serious blockade in the early stages of the war, because Wilson was initially very alarmed that um, war in Europe was going to have a very downside effect on the American economy. And um, he therefore took a very tough line with the Allies about the blockade. That, for example, he insisted that the US cotton crop must continue to be shipped to Europe. And cotton, as you all know, was a key component of explosives. And American cotton was still being shipped to Germany for a couple of years. Um, and a lot of other stuff too. Um, but actually, after about the first year, um, Wilson realized that far from being bad news to the American economy, this was actually terrific news for the American economy. Everybody was booming, producing armaments for uh, the Allies. But as to, it's a very difficult question to answer, did it serve US interests too? I think it probably broadly did, because it did, I say, it did bring the whole thing to a conclusion. But whether in a narrowly American sense, America could have stayed out, um, I don't know. It's, it's a hard one. I think you as Americans are a better place to judge than I am. Uh, thank you for a wonderful discussion. You really Look, um, It was terrific. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having me. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.